So far with glycolysis and with the citric acid cycle, we've just kind of been walking through them and making tallies of which molecules are produced. We haven't really talked about why we care about this. Why is that important? And here's where hopefully that's going to get cleared up a little bit. This next step right here. Um, so the electron transport chain, this is something that, that exists in mitochondria. And what's going to happen is all of those electron shuttle molecules that we generated, all of the NADH and FADH2s, they are all going to come over here inside of the mitochondria. They're gonna bring, um, bring their electrons over and hand them off at the electron transport chain. So what is the electron transport chain? It's a set of proteins that are embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So here's the first one. And you can see there's a whole series of them sort of laid out in this membrane. So all of those electron shuttle molecules, NADHs, they're going to come over, dump their electrons off, just meaning hand it off to this protein, and what that's going to allow is for NAD to be regenerated for one thing. So this can go back to glycolysis and the citric acid cycle and, and do its job again. Um, but let's focus in on the electron for right now. So that electron that gets handed off here, this is a high energy electron. It's something that that molecules don't really like to hold on to. It's kind of like a hot potato. It's gonna get passed off really quickly. So this electron, it's going to get passed from the first pump down the chain. It's gonna end up at the second pump and then finally to the third pump, so on and so forth. Why are we calling these pumps? Well, in the process of handing over the electron, What's going to happen is this protein facilitates the transfer of a hydrogen ion from this side of the membrane all the way over to this side of the membrane. So literally, it is acting as a pump. Okay? And the high energy electron is what's powering that pump to function. So that is true for all three of these. There's a first pump, a second pump, and a third pump. They're all pumping hydrogen ions across that membrane. And what that's doing is establishing a gradient, a concentration gradient. There are a lot of hydrogen ions that build up on this side of the membrane. And it's kind of like they're trapped there. They don't really have anywhere that they can go except for one place. Okay, there's a special molecule down here at the end of the transport chain. This is called ATP synthase. And this ATP synthase has a little channel through it that allows hydrogen ions to flow through. As they flow through, so they're gonna be going in this direction, back across the membrane. As they flow through here, uh, this causes this molecule in purple, um, it has a little section that spins. It's almost like a, a turbine spinning in water. And uh, what that's going to do is cause ADP to get connected to inorganic phosphate. What that's going to form is ATP. Okay, so this hydrogen gradient, this hydrogen ion gradient, proton gradient, that's flowing through here is actually causing ATP to be generated. Wow, so that's a lot of ATP that can be produced right here. This is where most of the ATP is going to come from due to the breakdown of glucose. It's right here. All right, so that electron that we were talking about, where does it end up in the end? It was jumping from, from pump to pump. In the end, the thing that finally takes the electron and can hold on to it is an oxygen molecule. Okay, so oxygen is the final electron acceptor, and that is definitely something to know. The final electron acceptor right here is oxygen. And what oxygen will do once it takes up those electrons is it'll form a water molecule. It combines with a couple of hydrogens and we get water. So waste products that we have produced uh, during this whole process of cellular respiration, waste products include carbon dioxide, we saw that earlier, and right here we're generating a little bit of water. So carbon dioxide and water, right? And those are the two things that you breathe outwards. Without this oxygen, this whole process would just come to a halt. If there was no oxygen available here to take the electron, um, then this chain would stop functioning. Electrons would no longer be passed down. It would just all kind of grind to a halt. And consequently, we would not be making ATP. This ATP synthase would not be functioning because there would be no gradient up here. So it's really key. Having this oxygen is really key to allowing this whole electron transport chain to function. And that's aerobic respiration. 
So what you should do at this point is pause the video and just take a minute, a few minutes, and fill out this table. This will be really good practice for just really thinking about each of these different stages of the breakdown of a glucose molecule. So during glycolysis, how many ATPs were made? Um, how many NADHs were produced? How many FADH2s were produced? So go ahead and just fill out this whole table. So we've got glycolysis, then we've got the, the grooming step um, where a, a carbon is stripped off from pyruvic acid, and then finally the citric acid cycle. Okay, so go ahead and, and tally up for each of these how many are produced. And then what I'd like for you to do is a little bit of a calculation. Okay, so I'm just going to give you this information. In theory, from the electron transport chain, each NADH molecule that goes to the electron transport chain ends up yielding three ATPs from that ATP synthase. Okay, each FADH2 molecule ends up powering the production of two ATPs. So given that, see if you can calculate what is the theoretical ATP yield for one molecule of glucose. And I'm just going to tell you up front, you're going to get a number other than 32. Okay, so go ahead and see if you can calculate how many ATPs are produced and then, um, and then resume the video and we'll talk about this. So go ahead and pause it and give that table a try. So why is the theoretical yield that you calculated here, why is this number different from 32? I've told you at the very beginning of this whole set of lectures that one molecule of glucose gives us about 32 ATPs. Um, that's the actual yield of ATP. So why is there a difference? Why is the theoretical value different from the actual value? And this makes sense if we think about it. Remember all of this, uh, the electron transport chain um, is being carried out inside of a mitochondria, which has a membrane around it, right? So ATP molecules, uh, think about the size of them. They have these big bulky phosphate groups attached, and that's not something that generally can diffuse across the membrane. So just in order to get ATP molecules from the mitochondria out into the cell, like into the cytoplasm where it can be used by other things, that actually takes a little bit of energy. The ATP molecules themselves have to be transported, and that transport process uses up a little bit of energy. So meaning we lose a few molecules of ATP just in that transport process. So that's why they don't quite match up with each other.